Hello there, beautiful teachers, and welcome to this Vibrant Music Teacher Chat. This is the weekly show here on YouTube for music teachers who want to teach with more creativity, who want to run more efficient businesses and profitable ones. And that's the topic of today's show, because we're going to be talking about money. This is a really important topic right now in almost every part of the world. We're feeling some pinches starting to happen and we need to be smarter than ever with our money. So to celebrate a new course release inside Vibrant Music Teaching, which is called Money Maximizers, we are going to be diving into a few different tips on how to save money and how to make more money later in the show. Before we get there, though, we are going to get into our warm ups. So if you haven't experienced this before, let me give you a quick rundown. We're going to do two different types of warm ups. We're going to do a sulfur railroad card and a reading railroad card. All you need to do is follow along. So you're going to sing along with the sulfur railroad in sulfur or saying la 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 or do 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 or just humming. But really do it. Don't just imagine it. Don't just say, yeah, yeah, that would be nice for students. Really do it yourself because this is about connecting to your own musicality in a simple way that you can do every week with me here on the show. And then in Rhythm Railroad, we're going to do some action. So I'll explain those when we get to them. But let's start with that singing. OK, so this is Sulphur Railroad. If you haven't seen it before, welcome. We do the second level here on the show is where we're up to number 12 in the second level. We skip the first level because that is just so and me. But this level is still relatively simple. It's just the pentatonic scale. It's not the full major scale. And it's a great starting point for anyone. So even if you're a teacher who has been teaching for years and years and years, you might never have done singing with your students. You might never have done much singing yourself. And it's a great way to connect to your musicality. So we're going to give this a go. I am not going to sing only because it'll mess you up with the backing track. So what I'm going to do is just do the sulfur hand signs. That's what I practice during these sessions because I always want to get better at those. I'm OK at them now. But I'm still not really like a Kodai teacher, so I'm not amazing at them. So I'll do the self hand signs. You can do those with me or just sing or hum or do something of your choice, but do something, participate. We're going to do this with the slow track first. There will be a count in for one bar, one measure. So there's going to be the tonic chord, the starting note, and then one measure in, and then it'll start. Here we go. a thing on the end by the way that's just me doing jazz hands to finish it out even though I made a mistake okay if you didn't sing that time definitely sing the second time this is with the faster track here we go expecting it to go to Ray before it does there. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. We're going to give the Rhythm Railroad a go now. So this is Rhythm Railroad and we actually finished a level of Rhythm Railroad last year. Congratulations to everyone who was at least a little bit a part of that. We finished the whole level. So we're starting on level three, which is called Clapper. So this is Clapper number one. There are different actions that you do in this. <laughs> Thank you for that, Elizabeth. I'm glad you love the jazz hands. Um, there are different actions you do in this, so I'll explain them. The dark blue one with the two hands, that means tap with both hands, like on a surface. Okay, so I'll do mine in, my, in the air so you can see it rather than hear it. And then one hand is just tap with one hand. So you're normally on our laps when we're doing this in the studio. If you can hear that rain, I apologize. I can't do anything about the rain in Ireland. Hopefully you can hear me okay. And then the foot is obviously tap your foot. And the sh orange one is touch your shoulders, okay? So I would normally try this first counting with my students. We're just going to launch right in and we're going to try it with the slow track today. 
Oh, geez. Sorry. Made a mess there. There we go. Nope, there we don't go. Here we go. Oh my gosh, what am I doing? There we go. Three, ready, go. <laughs> try the faster version. If you didn't participate that time, try it out. It's super fun. It doesn't matter if you get it right or wrong. It's only you, right? In your kitchen or in, in your living room or something. Okay, congratulations, well done, no matter how much of it you got or didn't get. <laughs> I hope you had fun doing it and helped you tap into your own rhythm and your own listening skills. Okay, so our main topic of today is money. <laughs> We're going to be talking about how to make more money in your studio. And there are really two ways to do that. So right now, if you feel like you need to make more money, you need to be a more profitable studio, then listen up because there's two ways to do it. You can either make more money, that might be what we jump to first, or you can save money. You can simply spend less because your profit is just what you take in versus what you spend on stuff, okay? Before we get to either of those, I've got a little PSA, I guess, which is if you don't currently have a separate bank account for your business, meaning you are using your personal account for everything. Please get a separate business account. <clears throat> if you are a sole trader or just classified as self-employed rather than like incorporated or LLC or anything like that, in most countries, in most places, you don't actually need to have a business bank account, but you should have a separate account, even if it's just a separate personal account. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's your number one base to cover because if you don't have that, you're not organizing your money in the first place and things are getting all mixed and muddled together. Now let's talk about how you could make more money in your studio. Add your ideas into the chat. How could you add more income into your studio? So the first obvious one is to fill your empty lesson spots. If your studio currently has space for more students, that you want to teach, not that are currently breaks that you actually need to keep in your schedule, but if you actually have spots that you want to fill, then you could be making more money because you could have students in those spots and you don't. Now, this is more of a delicate balance than it sounds like because I believe your budgeting should actually be based on like 95, 90% full, not 100% full. Now, to be fair, most of the time my studio is almost 100% full, but I like this idea of this little buffer. So if you base your income on like trying to build up to a level that you're comfortable with making, that is just 95% of your schedule is full, if your available teaching hours are full, then you've got this wiggle room. And I like to think of it as if it's um, like a hotel. They don't base their numbers, their budget, on 100% occupancy. No. Or even an Airbnb, same thing. No, it's not based on 100%. It's based on like 70% or whatever they know is a good occupancy rate for where they are based and the seasonality of the area and all that kind of stuff. So we shouldn't be basing our studio budgets on 100% of our schedule. Hopefully we'll fill it most of the time, but students are sometimes going to move on. They're going to move away. They're going to decide they can't do piano for whatever reason. So what do we do then? If we've based everything on 100%, we panic. 
So I think 95% is a good rule. Now, if you're below that, so you're just wanting to fill your spots in general, you need to get out there and market. It's not going to happen for you. And this is a bit of a touchy one for me because when I see new teachers posting in Facebook groups, etc., and they ask, how do you get new students? I'm trying so hard, but I can't fill my empty spots. And they get a whole bunch of answers from experienced teachers who have been running a studio for a long time saying word of mouth. I just want to kind of <laughs> gently interject and say, that's not helpful. You might get a lot of your students from word of mouth when you've been in business for a while. But that doesn't mean for a new teacher that that's helpful advice. You can't manufacture word of mouth. You could try and encourage people to tell their friends. And you can even have incentive programs. But really, that kind of word of mouth they're talking about just comes from already having a full studio. And having had a full studio for many years so that people just know about them. But that's not good advice for a beginner teacher. So we do have a whole course on marketing inside Vibrant Music Teaching. And we also have an area on the site, the free site for those who are not members, can't afford membership right now, totally fair enough. Go to the blog, which is colorfulkeys.ie and go to the page that's called the Business Hub. So you go to colorfulkeys.ie slash business or just in the menu, choose the business page and you'll find a whole section on marketing there and loads of ideas for you to try. This video is not about marketing specifically, but that is the obvious choice is to fill your lesson spots if they are currently empty. So the next thing you can do, the next obvious option, which is going to be uncomfortable for many people, if you are not making what you should be and you want to bring more money in, is to raise your rates. I know, I know, I know, I might say this quite often, but I do hear from a lot of teachers that they heard me say it however many times. They've been a member for all five years we've been running and I've been saying it, hopefully not nagging them, but saying it every so often for all of that time and it finally sunk in. So I'm going to say it here again. If you have not raised your rates this year, <laughs> I was going to say recently, this year, you need to think about doing it. Not right away, don't jump the gun, don't immediately raise your rates and scare everyone away. That would be terrible business practice. But you could raise them in January, that's a natural point to change fees, or next summer. But you need to make a plan of when you're going to raise those rates if you didn't do it this year, or if you just didn't do it by enough this year, because inflation in general is kind of at about 7%. Depends where you live, might be higher, might be lower, but look it up locally, it's about 7% here. And there are other costs that are rising too. So if you didn't at least raise by the rate of inflation, you gave yourself a pay cut this year and you need to make up for it somehow. So you actually need to pay, raise by more than that if you want to pay increase. All I did this year personally was match inflation, but I raised my rates beyond the level of inflation for every other year for the past seven. <laughs> so... I was starting from a place where I'm not at the top of the market at all. I think a lot of peop people might expect me to be, but I'm not. I don't live in an affluent area. We're not the most expensive lessons around by quite a long stretch. But we did raise to keep up with inflation and we do raise them by some percentage every single year. Okay, so then let's get to the less obvious options because I know I've been saying things you already know so far, right? Well, there are other things you can add into your studio to bring more money in the door. One of the things that I do in my studio is that I incorporate different types of lesson formats. These are not, the ones that I choose at least, are not the most profit maximizing, but they do make a little bit of a difference. So number one that you may have heard me talk about before is buddy lessons. That's how most students learn in my studio. And if you haven't heard me talk about it before, Again, you can look up all our articles about it, but the basic idea is student A, Alice, comes for 30 minutes from 3 to 3.30. Student B, Bill, comes at 3.30 and Alice stays. So Bill and Alice have 30 minutes together from 3.30 to 4. Now Alice goes home and Bill stays for 30 minutes 
So each of the students has had 30 minutes of solo time and 30 minutes of time together. They get a one hour lesson, but they don't have to pay for the full hour. And you effectively take up 45 minutes of lesson time per student, so a 90 minute block for two. And you don't charge for 45 minutes, you charge for a bit more. So in general for that format, I would be charging for like 52 minutes um, based on a regular rate. Now I don't charge them per lesson, so don't get all in a snit, <laughs> that's not what we're talking about. I charge monthly or semesterly, but in terms of working at a per lesson rate, that's how it equates to solo lessons. It's about 52 minutes versus a 62, 60 minute solo lesson, right? It would be the equivalent of about 52 minutes. So I we make a little bit more for that time. The student gets more time than they would have been able to afford otherwise. And everyone's a winner because we get to do really fun stuff during that overlapping buddy time. Now, that's not the only different type of lesson format we employ in my studio. So we also do travel to students' homes and we do solo lessons there and we do some solo lessons at the studio. When we're traveling to students' homes, we charge extra for that. It should be at a premium because it costs us a lot of money to travel there, right? Whether we drive or we get the bus or we cycle doesn't matter. It's costing us in time. So that's another area where you have to make sure you're charging enough. But the really profit maximizing sort of area of our studio is the group lessons that we offer. Now we're not a primarily group lesson studio. If you wanted to go full on profit direction, I won't sniff at you, no problem. You should move towards groups. That's going to be the most profitable, not the easiest and maybe not your style in terms of teaching. But if you want a good balance, you could have a studio like mine where we have a little bit of different things. So we have the buddy lessons for most students. We have solo lessons for some students and we have traveling fee lessons. And then for group lessons, we have a preschool program. So that is called Mini Musicians. The full curriculum is available inside Vibrant Music Teaching. So if you're not a member, it's $27 a month and you get access to this entire preschool curriculum on top of everything else that's in there, which, you know, you could be paying huge licensing fees for. But we don't operate like that. We just have one membership and it's all in there. So Mini Musicians is the program we offer here and you can offer the same one if you want to. It's like four to six students in a class generally. You can do less if you want. And it's our classes are 40 minutes, but it's a very flexible curriculum. So once you dive into it, you can decide what you want to offer. That's a great way to add in some extra revenue that you didn't have otherwise. Often it can work in off peak times. So, you know, um, if schools let out the younger students earlier, Maybe you can offer mini musicians in that window between when the younger students let, get let out. Here, I think it's 1 or 12.30 for the younger students. And then the older students are at 2.30 or 2 usually. So there is that window where actually it can work out really well to have preschool lessons. Personally, here we do them on Saturdays. And this year we're able to do two classes. So we have an 11 a.m. and a 12 p.m class on Saturday mornings. Um, I don't run those lessons right now, another teacher here does, but the curriculum is all laid out and I did it initially to make sure everything was running as we wanted it. Now, we do have one more type of group lessons at the moment, and that one is not available inside Vibrant Music Teaching yet, because I'm still working on it. So that's something I knew I added this year. It's a similar group to many musicians in that it's no practice requirement and it's very relaxed in um, pacing but it's for seven to nine year olds so if that sounds interesting we're gonna see how it pans out but maybe that'll come out next year that's what I'm working on at the moment um, and again the more groups you can add in within your comfort level the more money you are gonna make for your time it's a better way to leverage your time okay the other thing you can add in to make more money is extra workshops or camps. We don't do camps here, but it's very popular in different parts of the world and it definitely is a way to bring in income during normal school breaks when students don't want their regular lessons. So that can be an option. Um, we have in the past done one-off workshops that we charge for, 
I don't do that anymore. I actually roll them into tuition as bonuses, but that can work really well as well. So you can do a workshop that's like two hours or several days or full on camp for a week and you can do whatever you want with that, of course. Many teachers will do like a composing theme or a pop theme, chord playing theme. Whatever you do, I would just make it really enticing to students. You want to be able to sell it directly to them. You want it to sound like something cool that they want to opt into. Not like something their parents are going to love, particularly. And not just general music. Like, it's not just a music workshop. It needs to have a theme. It needs to have a hook. Because you need to be able to get students to convince their parents that they want to go. Or parents to convince their <laughs> their kids that they want to go. But... Ultimately, the kid's going to decide with something like that in most cases because it is going to be on a weekend or during a break and parents usually give their children some choice over that time. So if they don't think it sounds cool, you're not going to sell many tickets. But it can be a way to bring in extra revenue. Just keep in mind the marketing aspect of it. Okay, so those are four different basic ways to make more money and they can make a big impact but so can saving more money. So if you have any ideas of ways you saved money in your studio, please do add them into the comments. I've got a few to share with you in a sort of rapid fire format. So number one is music book budgeting. If you are someone who just spends way too much money on music books, it's time to set yourself a budget. That just won't fly. It is a business you're running. You have to Yes, account for some music book purchases, that's a necessary expense, but just buying things all over the place with no particular student in mind for them is not so business savvy. If you do provide materials to your students, if you, like, like me, have like a registration fee or materials fee, and you therefore provide everything to your students, you might look into studio licensing. So I have several books that I knew I was going to use a few times and therefore I bought the studio license rather than the one-off single license or the hard copy because I knew it would save me money over time. Recently I actually upgraded a few books as well. So um, June Armstrong, if you don't know June, she's wonderful and I have interviewed her here on the channel so you can check out my interview with her and you know preview some of her pieces she played for us. But June Armstrong at junearmstrong.com she has a feature where you can upgrade to a studio license even from a hard copy book which I just think is so generous of her so I had previously bought some hard copies of um, let me see it was paint box and uh, sea world I think were the two and I might have had a third one that I had hard copies before and I was able to upgrade those to a studio license because I know I need quite a few copies of them going forward because they're just great. So look into studio licenses and see if it can save you some money. And if you are purchasing something and you're not sure which to go for, check if they have an upgrade program because then you can buy a single user license or a one-off hard copy and you know you can upgrade later if that's going to work out better. The next thing to do is to buy stationery or any other consumables in your studio in bulk. Okay, so actually there are many things I buy in bulk for our studio. You know, we buy the big bottle of hand sanitizer, not the little one, so that we can replenish it, um, and soaps and things like that. Also toilet paper, because, you know, people go in and out of the bathroom, so we buy big boxes of that. Little things like this can add up, and also things like stationery. So I bought a, a box. It's only about this size, but it's a surprising number of pencils inside of pre-sharpened pencils. I made sure they were sharpened already. Um, and yeah, we, we haven't even touched on getting through them, but it's just great because we just have them and I don't have to think about pencils anymore. So are there things like that that you keep picking up one or two here or there and you should actually just buy a whole bunch? Buying a book can save you a lot of money in the long run. And then there are things like fees. So these can be fees for, say, your bank. If you do have a separate business account, I hope you do. Different banks have different fees. So make sure you're getting the best 
value for money in terms of those fees. And then for everything within the bank account as well. So if you have subscriptions you pay for, if you um, have bills for your studio, like heating and electric electricity, um, all those kinds of things, comb through your bank accounts, have a look and see whether you can get a better deal. Often all it takes is to switch providers or sometimes all it takes is to threaten to leave your current provider and they will give you a better deal. And yeah, it's a nuisance. I hate that that's how things work, but it is. So if you haven't done that for a little while, make sure you check out all the different fees that you pay and things that you pay for for your business. Make sure you're getting the best deal you can for those things. And then once you have switched providers or whatever you needed to do, set a reminder for yourself for when your contract expires or comes due again to check it out again. Because normally you just get put on a worse contract at the end of the period, <laughs> unless you call and nag them, which is, as I said, annoying, but reality. Okay, so I hope that's given you some great ideas for making more money and saving money in your studio and it helps you build a more profitable business that you can sustain. Because if you don't have a sustainable business, if you're not making a profit, it's not you being greedy to try and do that. It's actually for your students too. Because if you aren't profitable, if you're not making ends meet, you can't stay in business for the long term. So you can't serve your students. You can't be the low stress <laughs> teacher that they need. You can't be your best version of your teacher self if you're worrying about money. If you want more money tips, we have this whole course inside Vibrant Music Teaching. It's just recently released. It's called Money Maximizers, and I have left a link for it in the description if you want to check it out. I think YouTube didn't let it be a proper link, so you can just copy paste it into your browser if you're a member and head on over or find it inside the course library. Okay, if you've been tuning in from the very start, you know I promised you something cozy to make up for all the money talk. Isn't this cozy and lovely and autumnal? Or, no, there's no word for me to make fall into that, is there? Fallish? <laughs> anyway, I won't get sucked off in that tangent. Um, right, let me see, because I missed some questions already, but if you have a question, just type the word question, followed by your question, and I'll make sure to answer it. The mushrooms, I, I mean, the squirrel is, is it a squirrel or a chipmunk? Someone can examine that more closely than I can, staring off to the side and let me know. But uh, the mushrooms are my favorite. I just love them and all the falling leaves. It's great. Um, okay, so if you have a question, type it into the chat. Um, but I saw one already that I wanted to come back to. Tanya, do you usually have your students say rhythm syllables when doing these? So no, actually. What I do is I we preview them first together, we go through them, either counting, so one, two, and three, or whatever way they're counting, or saying the rhythm syllables, tum, ti, ta, um, just without the track. So that's the preview, we read through it together. And I say all together because it's usually in the buddy portion of the lesson. So I'd have two students plus me, and we all do it together. And then this is in the first few weeks of term. And then after that, I start calling on one of them to be the counter and the other one just does the actions. And then we do at least two exercises so they both get a turn to be the one who says the rhythm syllables or counts. And then we do it all together. I don't normally count while it's going, while the track is playing. I want them to listen and try and stay in time that way. But if they're having trouble following it, I will point. So I have it up on a screen my studio, I use the slides versions just like we did here. You can use the book version as well, but I have it up on a screen and I just point with a pen um, from underneath so that they can still see the way it is set up in my studio. That's the best way for them to see. And I point and tap the notes as we get to them if they're having trouble staying, staying in time. Not saying in time because we're not saying anything. <laughs> Hope that helps, Tanya. Um, Christy, this is a good tri tip. Use an ink subscription for my printer uh, copier because of all the digital sheet music that needs to be printed. Only $10 a month. Yes, I actually have a subscription 
and I don't always bring it up because it's uh, it's Ireland only. But if anyone is watching in Ireland, there's a place called Cartridge Green, and they will refill your printer cartridges um, for a flat annual fee. And it's just epic because you can just go there and you drop them off and pick them up half an hour later. And it feels free. I mean, you pay once a year, but you it's dirt cheap. Um, I'm always waiting for the, the year I go in and they're like, yeah, we raised it by 500% because they don't, <laughs> I'd still pay it. Um, yep, yeah, another good tip to buy the generic version. As I said, I do the refills, which is also more eco-friendly, which I love. Yeah, HB Instant Ink is recommended by a lot of people in the States as well. Awesome. Okay, I don't see any new questions coming in, so we might wrap it up. I did ask at the start whether a new time of half hour earlier would work for folks, and it seems like it would. Oh, if there is a question coming through, I'll answer that in a second. But it seems like it would, but let me know if that wouldn't work for you. If we started a half hour earlier than we did today, would that work okay for you? It's just a, a question I'm floating out there. We might keep it at the same time. Tracy, on subject of workshops, have you done them online and what works best? I'm thinking rote, maybe. For workshops, I usually wouldn't do a rote um, piece because a workshop is a one-off for me. It's not a, like, that's how I define the word in my own brain. It's not like a primary mode of teaching, right? So it's a one-off, it's on a special topic or it's something supplemental in some way. So I normally wouldn't be teaching actual repertoire at all, reading or rote. I would be doing improvisation, I would be doing games, I would be doing practice skills, it depends on the theme and what I'm doing. But we have a resource inside Vibrant Music Teaching called the Ultimate Adaptable Music Workshop. And that's what I do every time now. So if you check that out, you'll see how I piece it together. It's different every time, but it's the same kind of structure based on these different modules or bits that we've put together. And uh, yeah, that'll walk you through the whole thing. So the ultimate adaptable music workshop, you can look for that in the training library. Um, Abby, for buddy lessons, do you try to pair students up at the same level? No, same age, not same level. I'm quite happy to make things work, to come up with lesson activities that have, you know, work for students at multiple levels. Um, again, that's outside of the scope of just a quick question on a chat like this, but we do have stuff on the blog about that and workshops about it in the Vibrant Music Teaching site. But the short answer is no, I pair based on age. So I try to get students within like a year, maybe two of each other, um, depending on the students. But really within a year is what I'm aiming for. And then I don't mind if they're the same level or not, because no two students really are the same level anyway. Even if they sort of are, they're not. I mean, there's no such thing. So <laughs> they can be close, sure, but they won't be exactly the same. Okay, I hope that answers all your questions. Thank you all so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure as always. And I hope you enjoyed my crown of magical autumnal leaves and the tips about making more money and saving more money and I will see you next time. Bye everyone!